Well, just by way of introduction, um, I was just thinking back, when, when did I get roped into this affair? It was August 2015 that I first heard from Rachel Zoltan. And uh, some months later, I, I produced a, a report to compile what was known at the time about this waste site. And now we are, <clears throat> almost two years later, um, <coughs> And things are on the move in the construction. Uh, mainly what I want to talk about tonight is new data, which I, I sent in a Freedom of Information request to the EDC. It was collected in April, and uh, I just got it. Uh, we, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit incomplete. But we'll, uh, so I'm stuck fast. Show you what we got. I, uh, just, just to give us a little grounding in history, um, this site was a, a quarry consisting of three holes. This is a marble quarry. Uh, these two holes, this is uh, Marbledale Road here, and these are the two that got filled in. So this is back in the 40s, <coughs> 1954. <coughs> started filling in the northern lobe, and then by the mid-60s, they were filling in the, the southern, southern lobe. So now it's all, it's all at the mountain level. Whole host of sources of contaminants to this quarry, an unlined pit is possibly about the worst kind of place that you want to put. Uh, chemical waste that's fractured and unlined and deep. Um, and I've highlighted things that are sources of volatile contaminants, which is the focus here. Stuff volatile, stuff that can get into the air. Freon, cleaning chemicals, solvents, lab waste. Wide variety of things. And I'll just say that you know, for all the testing that's been done on this site, there's, I'm sure, hundreds of other compounds which have never been tested. Because there's only limited lists of chemicals. Pharmaceuticals is a whole category of chemicals that's never been tested. All right, so there's two kinds of samples that have been taken relative to contamination, contaminants in air. One is underground samples. Vapor, soil gas vapors, they're called. And these are, can either be collected out in the field or they can be collected from the building. So back in 2015, there were 18 of these samples collected at the landfill site, the dump site, more appropriately. Uh, <clears throat> then in 2016, two commercial properties, the building that uh, Rachel's studio was in, plus the Broken Bowl brewery. And then later in that year, there was some samples collected actually along the uh, along Marbledale Road and a couple other spots. And I'll show you that. First, let me just give you, this is a real broad, broad overview of where contamination is at the site. So here's Marbledale Road. So north is pointing that way. And very generally speaking, um, there's a lot of freon in the middle of the site. Uh, some of that came from aerosol cans that were buried, but we know that from the identity of the freons that there's, there's more. There are more sources of freon at the site. Up on the north side is uh, most heavily contamination of uh, PCE and TCE. We're going to talk a lot about those two chlorinated solvents, per chlorinated um, triethylene, uh, I'm sorry, perchlorinated ethylene and trichloroethylene. And we've got some petroleum compounds uh, which are more in the south end. If we look at, now I've turned the thing sideways, so north is up. Um, <coughs> 
So DEC went and hired a contractor to collect some samples back in November of 2016. And they tested for a whole suite of compounds. And they found high levels of perchloroethylene higher than in the dump at various sites here, up to a thousand, and the unit, and they're going to be consistent with this unit, is micrograms per cubic meter. So <coughs> you can imagine a cubic meter of air and how many micrograms of chemical are in that. And this may sound like a tiny amount, but it's enough to cause health problems. So, this was up to a thousand of the perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene up to 120. So there's contamination, there's vapors in the site and off the site. <coughs> okay, there's been further monitoring, and this <coughs> goes back to 2016, and this is specifically to look at vapor intrusion, which Lenny's going to talk about in greater detail. So, in a, let me skip to the next thing here, which is, I have to hit the right arrow. <coughs> okay, so, DEC comes in and they, here's a building, a generic building, they'll punch holes in the floor, they'll collect the vapors underneath the building, the sub-slab, papers, they collect indoor air samples, and then they collect outdoor air samples. So three kinds of samples. So what they call ambient air gives you a reference value, and subslab tells you what the danger is of contamination leaking into the building. And then of course the indoor air tells you how bad your air is. So, small raw summary here is there's been several rounds of these things, and I'm going to focus on this, this latest round, April 2017. <laughs> properties and they're, I believe, on the east and west ridges. That's what I was told by DEC, but I don't know how they're distributed because they have not revealed the locations. All right, so the three, I'm going to, I'm going to focus in on, on three compounds. The aforementioned trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, and also Freon. Freon is, uh, was used as a, uh, a refrigerant. It's found in air condition, old air conditioning equipment. It's been, it was banned in the 90s because it destroys stratospheric ozone. So here's the questions to ask as we look at the information. You've got, we'll have samples of indoor air. The question is, where is it? Where's the contamination coming from? Is it coming from underneath? There's vapors migrating up into the building? That's, that's the purpose of this, to look at that. Is there, are there sources inside? Is there chemicals stored in the closet? Are there cleaning products? Uh, petroleum, gasoline, you know, stored somewhere that's releasing vapors? And then finally, there's the outdoor air itself, which of course is coming, moving in and out of the building. That can be a source of contamination. Now, <clears throat> deference to our meteorologists, I put in meteorology matters, and that's because meteorology does matter. Um, when they collected these sam samples in April, it was from the 4th to the 6th, we had a lot of rainy weather. The wind is correct from the southeast? Correct. Okay. 
and the barometer was rising. The rising barometer tends to suppress the release of the vapors. Right? Because pressure, atmospheric pressure is increasing, it's pushing down more. <laughs> Nonetheless, you'll see that there indeed were vapors of concern in the air. All right, uh, if you can bear with the, the, the strange screen and the strange colors here. Uh, it didn't look like this on my computer. <laughs> Must be vapor <laughs> Okay, so what I'm show, I'm going to I'm going to do the same pattern for all these samples. And what I'm showing you is a comparison of the indoor air and something else. In this case, we're looking at the indoor air compared to the sub-slab air, what's underneath the building. And I've paired these things according to building. And most, if not all of these, are residential properties, my understanding. There, there might be one commercial property. I don't, I don't know <clears throat> which that is. Okay, so this is Freon we're looking at, and <coughs> you can see most of the indoor air is in this one to three range, with the exception of this one. And this one doesn't have a high level of Freon underneath the building, so that's not pointing to the sub-slab as a source. In comparison, you're looking at this one, HO9, and the level in the indoor air, the purple bar is, is pretty low, around two and a half. What's underneath the, the building is really hot, 170. So there's clearly there's a source of contamination nearby, and it's collecting underneath, but it's not getting inside the building. So that's that's the good news. And by the way, where you see gaps, that means it's not the, the compound's not detected, so it's at a low level, or there's missing data. There's that too. All right, so that's comparing indoor and sub-slab. Let's compare the same indoor with the outdoor air, outside air. Okay, so same indoor stuff. You got this one that is really high. Outdoor air, pretty low, pretty consistently, one to two. That's statewide. That's, that's a pretty consistent level. And... It's, it's my conclusion is, well, it looks like the indoor the air and the outdoor air are pretty much the same. For this day of sampling, okay, this is, let's not try to extrapolate to every situation. So that's the Freon story. So overall, um, Indoor, outdoor, they're all in the one to three range, except for this one where there appears to be Freon leaking from something inside the house. And this one where you've got a high level underneath the structure, uh, but it it's, doesn't seem to be getting in. And all these levels are well below health risk. You need to get up into thousands to worry about health risk with Freon 12. <clears throat> Let's move on to PCE. And PCE and TCE are both highly toxic substances, so this is a good reason to focus on these guys. All right, same comparison. We've got the purple indoor air. This is PCE, perchloral, and here's the sub-slab. Indoor air consistently down in the under two micrograms. Notice we've got four places where the sub-slab is quite a bit higher by a factor of 
six, and these two really, really high. So there's an issue here with those two structures where perchloroethylene has accumulated under the, the building to high levels. Uh, HOO9 in particular is really high. Dr. Hughes, may I ask a question? Yes. Okay. The, the, the yellow, if you will. Yeah. The, the proximity to each other, is that significant or not? Or you don't know that? In other words, oh. are, are these properties... Are these no. Uh, I, 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 I wish. I wish I did. I wish TEC would tell me. So they could, be, they could be adjacent to each other or not? Right. Um, you would think, I mean, from other sampling regimes that I've seen, they usually number things in order. So it may be that these things are, are kind of near each other, but I, I just don't know. Yeah. Is there, are the ones that are lower, is that normal? What is normal level that you would expect in a non, you know, like a, I guess it would be zero, right? Like how do we... Oh, so what's, 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 a, what's a typical? Yeah. Um, what's a typical number for PCE? You're not near the... It was probably, probably 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 micrograms per cubic meter. It's, it's wow. Uh, yeah. In so, an area so like this in New York City, okay. we're much higher because of all the dry cleaners. Okay, so so all of those properties then have yeah. some elevated because they're higher than 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, right? You could say you, you might conclude that they're background, that, that, that you might have the same level here. This, the, this contamination is prevalent. Uh, in urbanized areas. Yeah, I, 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 um, I don't have the, the, the graph with me, but I did a comparison with some New York State data, mm -hmm. and Tuckahoe was above average okay. for, for PCD. Those are on the website, but yes, for PC, TC, and benzene, it's all crazy high. It's compared to Staten Island, Brooklyn, so yes, these numbers well, are we'll, we'll get to, to the next two towns. So, um, the, the real thing here is, is what's, well, we'll get to this next, next, uh, next thing here. Okay, so here's indoor air, again, same blue boxes. Now we're comparing to outdoor air. And what I've drawn in here, this, this line here, that's the DEC health-based guideline for long-term exposure. Okay, so if we're below that level, DECs, this came from the Department of Health, saying you're okay. If you're not an, an adult. Um, and so it's below that, except for this one. So we have, there we go. This is, um, so this, this graphic is a comparison of PCE and a whole bunch of other sites around New York State that are monitoring, monitored on a consistent basis, year to year, and collect like 50 samples a year. So they're monitoring stations. And here's the average level for Marbledale Road. Here's average levels in Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Upstate, and, uh, Buffalo area, Rochester, uh, all the things. And on the very bottom is the Adirondacks. Okay. So it's higher. It's it's certainly higher, but it's it's not you know it's not a factor of ten higher. It's somewhat. Higher, right. You'll see that's that's different for TC. So we're below that. We've got something going on here with the outdoor air. There's a source. Don't but know they didn't tell you what, where that was located. I have not they been able to this, but they didn't tell you where it was located? Yeah. Correct. What's wrong with these people? They I'm, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> They're protecting us, OK? Um, all right, so we'll figure it out eventually. Um, 
So here's what I'm saying in summary about PCE. Uh, mostly we're one to two micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, we had high to very high levels underneath the buildings for these four sites, which means it's potential for intrusion. Keep in mind, this is one day of sampling, and the barometric pressure was going up, that's going to tend to suppress those. Okay, so this is a best case scenario we're looking at in terms of vapor intrusion. Okay, let's move on to TCE. All right, so so once again, we're comparing the indoor air and these bluish bars with the sub slab. Okay, notice the scale here is is less, so we're zero to five. Um, Variable levels, indoor air, one, half, up to two and a half, 2.6. Um, Sub-slab levels, you notice there's a lot of gaps here. That means they're not detected. So sub-slab TCE, pretty much low across the board, except we got a hit here. We got a big hit here, 15. And we got some low low levels here, and then some more significant out there. So it doesn't seem to be much correlation. It doesn't seem to be based on what we're seeing here. We've got huge concentration of TCE underneath the building, not much in the building. We've got a higher level here in the building, hardly anything underneath. So it's not pointing to uh, intrusion. So isn't the safety level of the TCE 0.04? <coughs> we're getting to that. Okay. okay. I'm just, well, we're just looking at cause and effect right now. Okay. Okay. Now, now um, so here's indoor versus outdoor. I'm trying not to touch anything. <laughs> there seems to be more correlation here. And I've drawn in the level that New York State has set for long-term average, the health level, 0.2. And you can see we're pretty consistently above that, and in some cases, quite a bit above it. So again, the, the bluish bars are the indoor air. Outside air correlates pretty well, except for these ones on the end. Which was the one that was so big? What, what number was that? Nine. 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 It was nine. So why is nine way down there? Because it's not getting into it, the the stuff that's underneath the house is not leaking into the house. It's not really. Well, it's not outside either, right? Correct. It's. It's not right. So this is a low level here, and we're not seeing much outside. We're not, we're not able to detect what's outside. There's pro I'm sure there's some outside, but there's a limit to, how, to what you can detect. It, That's only TCE. Yeah, but it could be going in a different direction. It could be under somebody's house, but it could be taking a pipe and going into the air next door or something right. like that. Right, right. So, what I'm, uh, what I'm getting to here is that the source of the TCE that's in the houses is probably outdoor air. The TCE is getting into the environment from sources. The dump site is, I'm sure, a source. There's, we have, and Bob and Tim have collected data that show very clearly upwind versus downwind that picks up TCE as it crosses the site. Um, I have a theory that sewers are a conduit for this contamination. That's based on some data from Eastchester where there was a hot spot 
And that hot spot happens to be right where a sewer comes up from Marbledale Road up to Hall Avenue. Um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of opportunities for this stuff to get out into the air. Barometric pressure changes bring it out. Uh, wet versus dry, that brings it out. Uh, conduits of any kind, sewers, uh, electrical connections, move vapors. So it's, it's escaping into the air and it's keeping the air all over the area well above this 0.2 guideline. If we compare Takahoe with all these other sites across New York State, this is again, this is this DEC monitoring that's conducted weekly. This, this is the level that these guys are at. This is average, annual averages. Here's, here's Takahoe in 2016. So this, that's a level of one. One microgram per cubic meter. That's just Marbledale Road, though. That's Marbledale Road and, uh, and the landfill. Notice these guys are all less than point, certainly less than point one, substantially less than that. Let's, let's just go back. What? <coughs> so one, here's one, here's one. That was the level I was comparing with. We've got stuff above one. We've got 2.6, we've got 1.8. This is the outdoor air, folks. Do you happen to know that each of these locations is next to each other? I know that I know that there you've got the site down in Marbledale Road, you've got a bunch of houses on the west, you've got a bunch of houses on the east. My understanding is that's where the, the, the sampling was conducted. Wouldn't you expect the outdoor air to all be fairly similar on this particular ground? Wouldn't you expect them to be close? No, no, no. no. I would not because you have wind that's moving contamination. If the, if the dump site is the source, then if you're downwind, you're going to get a higher concentration than if you're upwind. Or off to the side. Okay. Right. But then you would expect two or three locations to have a similar kind of reading, even if let's just say they're the downwind. Well, location. we do. We have, we have that. So, would you say that this graph may even illustrate the way the wind patterns um, blow that oh, day? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. There's something I forgot to mention. Something I forgot. This is important. These purple bars. That's that's all of the data. So they didn't. So when they go and they they do a, a when they collect a sample, and I said sub slab indoor air outdoor air. They don't do an outdoor air for every house. So they'll have you know if you've got three houses and they're all being sampled, they'll collect one outdoor reference sample for all three of them. And so that's, that's what's going on here. So here's H003. This probably is the reference for this group uh -huh. here. This is for this one. Um, this is a duplicate, this H005. This happens twice. Um, and that, that goes to show you there's, there, there can be quite a bit of variability in the data also. Um, also, so these are pairs. Also, the timing of the sample, if they started or ended at a different time, they might right. get a different result. Shouldn't they be sampling within a certain time frame? Like they sample 15, over 24 hours. Yeah, but I'm, well, I'm thinking of a much tighter time frame, like 15 minutes or within an hour. Yeah, they, the, the protocol is 24 hours. You start, um, they, there's not a particular time of day that they start. Could be morning, could be... Afternoon. And they don't end all at the same time. Right? And they don't end all at the same time. But a duplicate sample, where they did one day and then the next, point? Yeah. So it was a lot, the wind was the same, but it was a lot more rain 
a lot more about it. Uh -huh. That tends to scrub the atmosphere. That could explain what you got a little bit. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that explains why this this one's much less right. than I mean, that. The variation is dramatic. I've, I have a question with, uh, yeah. with everyone here. Um, but the plume doesn't move in uniform, in unison. So by taking an average of three homes that perhaps are next to, next to each other, that's still a wide gap if you take three properties together. Mm -hmm. And that's not really, is that a tr I mean, is that really a good representation when, you're, when you've got such a wide area, three homes together that have different good sized properties? I mean, it seems like that's just, they're just doing something to sort of... Thanks for that. Yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's their protocol. Um, how much variability is there going to be I'll, I'll, over the I'll, space? I'll of, you know. Okay. Okay. You can you can address that. Um, um, Bob and Tim have, have done averaging over path lengths, which is more representative. Yeah. I thought the like I think it's the next slide you had shown before, where, where you're averaging a whole bunch of cities. Yes. And you have Tuckahoe at the top, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the other areas. Yeah. The other areas, is that the entire city? What is being uh, Oh, no, there? it's one, one location. They'll have one sampling location. Uh, okay. So it's, it's, a it's, it's apples and apples as but opposed it, to... It, it's typically away from a known source. Yeah, it's, okay. a, it's a monitoring site. At, that would at, at a the school. School. Yeah. So it's, 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 not, it's all of Buffalo uh, no. matching... You know, it's not all of Buffalo. Right. So they wouldn't put it next to a drive Right. 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 Thank you. It's a reference. It's a reference. Uh, not a little location. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so we started with um, well, uh, the first Freon. Freon. Yeah. Freon and then PCE, right? Yeah. And based on the graph and based on the numbers, we sort of determined that um, vapor intrusion is probably the likely contributor, right? But that there was a high potential for vapor intrusion. However, when we get to TCE, we mm -hmm. come to the conclusion that vapor intrusion is probably not the likely contributor, it's probably ambient air, right? So what, what can we sort of conclude from that, right? We know that looking at the original map, the TCE is in one area mm -hmm. of the site, predominantly there's another smaller area on the south side. That? I know that Dundon did an extraordinary amount of the crunching of the data, but everybody must remember the whole dump was never tested. He's got plumes of areas of the data that he has. There's lots of areas that were never tested. So we don't know those areas don't have TCE or PCE or Freon. That's, just, that's true. That's just no that's that's sort of just right. Right. I just based on the limited sampling that's been done at, at the site. Plus, right. let's not forget that the hotel, the brownfield, only represents half right. of the dump. Right. Do we have any information about the other half? No. Uh, right. But I guess, you know, yeah. regardless, it's, you know, how do you reconcile, right? That you would assume, you would sort of assume, or at least conceptually, from my perspective, that you would have sort of a cocktail of the various gases moving in the same plume, right? Mm -hmm. But your results seem to indicate otherwise, right? It seems to say the TCE travels by itself, whereas the other two chemicals travel in tandem with each other. You know? No, no, no. I would say that TC and PC are together. Yes, you should have the same ratio in the sub slab right. to the indoor air if, if it's a vapor intrusion for all of the chemicals. Yes. Right, but this, this isn't showing. So that indicates what he's saying mm -hmm. that it's likely coming from the outdoor air for all three for the TCE. For yep, because well, of this, it, this, it, it may be for the PCE as well. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The yeah. graph showed for the for the um, freon and for the PCE. We concluded that it showed really a potential for vapor intrusion. Of or, no, no, it only showed a potential, but it doesn't say that it's actually happening. Right, but it, but it but it showed low potential for ambient. Right. It's, I mean, if you go back like. Um, PCE. So you got, you got. Here's a property. It's got 720. That sub slab. Sub slab, right. and there's nothing detected in the indoor air. Nothing. 
But also, we don't know where that's taken in the house. We don't know if there's We don't. We don't know where it is. We don't know right. if they put it, they have the sub slab is on the other side of the property mm -hmm. underneath, and they put this in the upstairs room. We have no idea of records. Right. They, 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 they would put it in the, on the lowest, lowest floor. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll explain some of the dynamics of it there. Help you understand I mean, the sub, sub slab 9, right, which has off the charts, right? Mm -hmm. So go to TCE, sub slab 9. I mean, it's the, it's the, they're taking the same measurements. At the same time, right? That's correct. So it's non existent in the, in the TC chart. Oh no, it's there. there what about the other one? All the other one that spiked off the chart, right? Not just that, that right. So that that wasn't that wasn't detected in um, but I, I haven't gone to that level and I don't want to take up a lot of time right, looking sure, at, sure. at ratios because that right. that will that would be very instructive to do that, but I right. just haven't had time to do it. We're running low, um, a little low I'm on just, time. All I'm saying right, is that time. there's not a smoking gun here that says, oh, there's stuff pouring into this house. Right. That's all I'm saying. Right. There is clearly evidence that PCE is getting out just into the general air from Something. Right. I would say it's coming from the dump and contamination in that area, the Marbledale Road area. Right. Okay. We've got exceeding this guideline throughout. We've got possibility for intrusion, but it's not showing it. And then so that's why I said my conclusion is coming from the ambient air. And okay. So regarding the TCE, seventy percent of the indoor air samples were above this level, up to eleven times it. All the outdoor samples. 100% or above it. In that case, up 12 times. TCE is consistently below the EC cell catatonic. <coughs> and it's, it's throughout. Okay, so PCE and TCE are being emitted. How many places they're coming out, and what's the dynamics? I can't, I can't tell you that. Um, and this is, I put a big caveat on this, that there's no evidence from this single round of sampling that vapors are getting into the houses. But they did body. But they did that in April. But it's in April, right? Rising, rising barometric pressure, it's not, it's, it's not really, you should just forget about it, right? Because yeah, that's just one, one day of best case scenario, right? Okay. And the DC was approaching, was approaching for, it's getting on a best case scenario day for them. Right, right. And you so, saw some of those numbers under, in the subslide? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start by introducing vapor intrusion, but because you know Don Don's got a good point about outdoor air, I'm going to go beyond vapor intrusion. Vapor intrusion is an apt term is when toxic vapors in the subsurface are pulled up into buildings. The toxic vapors in the subsurface are there be normally because there is a release from an industrial site, underground storage tank, some sort of a spill, and chemicals such as TCE and PCE make it into the subsurface, where they can be in the soil as soil gas or in the, contaminating the groundwater. In this case, you don't, but you have a landfill, so you basically have materials that were directly deposited, perhaps in containers, barrels, or whatever, on the subsurface. If it's in the groundwater, a fraction of it will volatilize and appear as soil gas between the water table and the surface. No! If it's in the soil, it will also become a gas. It can move laterally in the soil, normally they say about 100 feet, in every direction. Um, if there is a preferential pathway, you know, 
uh, loose soil, gravel, uh, a sewer line, it can move far further. But normally the way that these chemicals move in the subsurface is in the ground line. Because basically these chemicals either dissolved or mixed in groundwater will move with the groundwater. And they can move for miles. So you have a release over here, it can, it can move as a vapor, but also can move as a as a liquid, volatilized, and it's actually sucked up by the building. That is, there's a lower vapor pressure inside the building than there is in the subsurface. Uh, there has to be a hole or crack for it to come up, but it can be a minuscule crack in concrete that you don't even necessarily see. So, when we talk about vapor intrusion, we're actually talking about buildings that are pulling up contamination. Um, before I get to how it's sampled, the advantage of that is that when you know there's a problem, you can put in a mitigation system, like a radon, similar to a radon system, where you lower the pressure here, by having a slotted pipe with holes in it, and a fan on the side usually, and you lower the pressure beneath the building, so vapors move down rather than up. So it's something, it's in a building, it can be addressed through a radon type system, for often less money than it takes to do all the sampling that you do at one of these sites. So, uh, there are basically two things that determine whether you're going to find vapor intrusion happening in, in a building. One is, is there a source? So, when, when Don showed those levels in the sub slab, that's a source. But it also has to do with the structure of the building. Is it well ventilated? Is it pressurized? Is, um, is there a tight seal on the basement? And one of the things they do in new buildings to prevent vapor intrusion is they, they put plastic or rubber um, at the foundation, or at the basement, to keep things from coming up. So you can have two buildings almost identical, above the same source, but different levels inside. So it, 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 it's logic you'd find variability because not all buildings are alike. So again, you need the source and the building to determine whether there's a problem. But finding contamination in indoor air doesn't mean that it's coming from the subsurface. That's why when they sample, they use multiple lines of evidence. The data that Don just pre presented. They sample the subsurface soil gas, the indoor air, and the outdoor air. If they don't find it in the subsurface, then it's probably not vapor intrusion. If they find it in the, you know, in the home at high levels, and I this, you know, know of homes like this, like gun cleaner or other plastic cement in my community, um, they found high levels and they were able to find there was a, a can with TCE in it. That's not vapor intrusion, and, but it was contaminating the indoor air. Or it could be coming from the outdoor air. If indeed the outdoor air for the area is contaminated and the windows are open, you're never going to get the levels inside below what's in the outdoor air. So again, you sample the subsurface, the indoor air, and the outdoor air. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to rush through this to make sure I cover everything, so, so I may have to come back to this. There's a, something called alpha. Greek letter alpha, which is the attenuation factor. That is the ratio of what's typically found inside to what's found in the subsurface. When you find high levels in the subsurface, that doesn't mean that they're going to be high levels inside. Because the ratio could be 1 1,000th or 1 10,000th. As something comes up into the building, it may be ventilated. Merely the fact that it spreads out within the building will lower the concentration significantly. In many states, they will only sample the sub-slash soil gas, and only if those levels are high will they sample inside. New York's been pretty good about this. They will sample both of them at the same time. Um, and, and that's really the correct thing to do, because the real measure of what people are exposed to is measuring what they're exposed to. And you use the sub-slab numbers simply to determine, one, if whether or not the indoor air contamination is caused by the contamination of the subsurface, or, and New York's good about this as well, 
If there's a really high level in the subsurface, even if it's not found indoors, they may put on a radon type mitigation system because at some point somebody will drill a hole in the floor or there'll be a crack in the concrete and it's going to come up. So preemptively, they will install mitigation systems to protect people from, from very high levels. And some of the levels that we've seen in the sampling are high enough under the New York Department of Health's matrices for TCE and PCE that they would install a mitigation system even though they haven't found the contamination inside above the action levels. So the complicating thing here, this is unusual. I, I've only run into it at a few sites around the country where you have high levels in the outdoor air. Now those high levels in the outdoor air are probably coming from the landfill. They may be there because of barometric pumping. They may be there uh, because of uh, rain raising the water table to the surface. They may be there um, due to sewer lines. No one has investigated that. But when I saw the, you know, when, when Will sent me the reports, what jumped out to me were the, the two samples at Hall and Morgan of 12 micrograms per cubic meter and 14 micrograms per cubic meter on different, different months. Those are very high levels for TCE and outdoor air. Um, the ecosystems report for the city said that's typical of an industrial area. You show me that industrial area. Um, I'm not, yes. Lenny, it's interesting you mentioned uh, the water table. There's supposed to be an aquifer that runs under, under the, the site. And there are uh, un, un quarries that have not been filled in that are north. And when we had heavy rain last month, there's one uh, across the street that I noted the, the water level was noticeably higher than it, than it has been. So uh, how that must affect uh, it's what's, it's what's conceivable. We don't, we, don't, we don't have the data. The one thing no. that, that we know from the various guidances, and I visited some sites like in Madison, Wisconsin recently, this is, this is my drawing of a basement. EPA, when they issued a recent rule having to do with vapor intrusion, they didn't call it vapor intrusion, they called it subsurface intrusion. Because here, the water got into the basement, and once the water's in the basement and volatilizes, it's much more of a problem than vapors trying to make it through the concrete. So wet basements will increase the chance of vapors getting into the building. So it's a similar kind of thing for outdoor. If the water makes it to the surface, the soil's no longer a barrier to the chemicals volatilizing. So outdoor air is something that you normally sample to prove that the contamination is coming from inside or below. Turns out here, it may be the source. But no one has really done the investigations. Those numbers really jumped out at me when I saw them. Um, someone asked about the house with, with about 14 micrograms per cubic meter. Chances are that's where they found it in the outdoor air and reported it in the reports near Holland Morgan. Um, don't know why it, you know, why it blew in that direction. Uh, they haven't been doing, and I'll get to this later, the kind of sampling that they need to do. So, Lenny? Yeah. Fun fact, the houses opposite where that sample was taken, yeah. one was told by the Department of Health or the DDC, uh, I don't know anything about that project. And then the other house was told, uh, we sampled enough homes in your area, we don't need to do yours. So one thing that the folks in Ithaca did, uh, South Hill and Ethica, is they, they, you know, the, the agency say, we have to protect your privacy, we won't tell you which houses these are. What the people in Ithaca did is they created a website and the neighbors all volunteered their information so they could come up with a with a map of where the contamination was. So that's what we have here. That's exactly it. So, so it is possible, you know, even though, and, and, and they genuinely believe they're protecting people's privacy. People do complain if they want to sell their house and we've given information that it's contaminated. People do complain. But a lot of people will say, hey, this, we're all in this together. Let's see what we can figure out by sharing the data. So there are two important concepts. And I'm going through this rapidly because of the time. One is called temporal variability. This is a notional graph. <laughs> temporal variability means variation over time. 
the, all of the sampling results vary over time. You take a snapshot, but you may or may not miss the problem. So they vary daily. With the, you know, in California, there's some sampling that's been done in San Diego. When the winds come up in the afternoon, they affect the barometric pressure, and the levels go up or down. They vary with the weather, and they vary with the seasons. This is true for indoor air, for, subs for soil gas, and especially for outdoor air. The wind changes, and the numbers are going to change. So, the historic ways of doing sampling, first are the summa canister, which which has been, been used here. It is a, an 8 or 24 hour sample normally. Summa canister is about this size, it's metal, it's got a valve on the top, you open it up, you collect the contamination, you collect the, the air, you send it to a lab and you sample it. That tells you, you know, what the levels were here. A newer way is a passive sampler they can do for 30 days. They can give you an average of 30 days. So that would be like maybe this, and you get the average. But particularly for TCE, neither of these works. And that's because EPA and state toxicologists have concluded that TCE at a relatively low level of 2 micrograms per cubic meter can cause cardiac birth defects. Babies born with heart malformations. And um, I recently became aware of how significant this was when my wife had heart surgery uh, for what she was told after the fact. This was a, a, a cardiac malformation she had since birth. Didn't know about it until after, but she had a problem until after age 50. So just because you don't know you've got a cardiac birth defect doesn't mean you don't have it. They, they can be very prevalent. We don't know what caused hers, but it, you know, it, it's something you're, you, you worry about, right? So that's at two. Uh, at two. Point. Right, at two. So what's important about it, though, is how long does, well, for cancer, we look at exposure over 30 years anymore. Well, how long a period should you be looking at for birth defect? It's got to be less than nine months, right? So, in fact, the, the government toxicologists, and by the way, industry says this is all BS. They don't believe it at all, uh, somehow. Uh, the exposure is from one day to three weeks in the first trimester pregnancy. Exposure, it's a short-term exposure that can cause the risk. So, if you were to sample here, but for me, my daughter would be pregnant here, I would have missed it. Now, DEC, when we talk about April as a sampling date, um, DEC and DOH, New York agencies, say to sample in the winter. That's when the conditions are worst. Um, April, you may miss the entire problem. But I go to these conferences that EPA sponsors, and they say you have to test 20 times a year to know for sure that you aren't going to have levels of TCE that won't put a pregnant woman at risk of having a baby born with cardiac birth defects. So what we argue is, until we have better sampling, let's just protect everybody, put in radon-type systems in all the buildings that might be affected, because it's cheaper to protect people than to do sample it to death. But the importance is that if you sample on the wrong day, and this would be true for outdoor air as well as indoor air, that you may miss a problem. So, what, and the other form of variation is geospatial variation. So you have a row of houses here. You might have a problem here and a problem here. And in between you won't. Or you might have a house with different levels within the same house. And I visited a house in Ithaca that DEC studied, and they had a, you know, the house was on a hill. And they had a different level in you know, one part here and another, another level here. So just because if you sample the wrong spot underground, the soil vapor, you might get the wrong thing. If you sample the wrong room in a house, um, you, you might 
you might miss the problem or not get the right numbers. Uh, my friend in Hopewell Junction, um, she found that not only did there was enormous temporal variability, but although usually you're supposed to have higher levels in the basement, and actually she has it's, it's her first floor, not really a basement. You know, she and her, and her family lives there. Um, she had higher levels upstairs because she concluded that she had cinder block walls you know, with you know, holes in them that were acting as a conduit and the gases were coming into her second floor and coming out in her laundry room. So what I recommend, and which is important for the question of whether you have outdoor air problems and knowing where they're coming from, would be not to use suma canisters, but to use equipment that can do near continuous monitoring at very low levels. So the kind of things they have on these, these community air monitoring stations, that's not, that's not what you want. You want a half site or an electron coupling device that can do basically report results every six minutes. Or something it's something like that. I don't know. You know, they're they're, they're different. And and that provides a couple of benefits. First, you can overcome this temporal variability, you know, which way the wind's going, time of day, all that. You just get a continuous result. And secondly, you can move it around to see if you can find the source or the entry point where contamination might be coming into a house. So this is a technique. It is more costly than doing a small number of suma canisters. But it's less costly than doing the number of suma canisters on as many dates as you would do to actually catch the problem or to know that there's no problem. So, you know, I, I, I can put some your, you know, people doing the work here in touch with the guy in San Diego who does this. Maybe he's, he's done some, some, you know, less than cost sampling for communities before. Maybe he, he'll work with you on it. But I would ask DEC to do near real time or near real time continuous sampling. And that's particularly important because you're trying to figure out where these high levels outdoor are coming from. You know they're coming from somewhere over there, but exactly where they're coming from, we really don't know. Yeah? Um, for over almost two years, we've been asking for the DEC to do sampling, especially in the wintertime in the Department of Health, and they refuse. What would you do to provoke I guess it's been two years of multiple letters, right. multiple meetings, multiple requests. I mean, I've had requests from the year before in April with the whole winter season coming, and then they tested us well all the way in March. What would you do to provoke them to actually do the right type of testing? Because they've avoided and evaded. So this is what I always say when I do a workshop. That the most important factor in determining whether you, your families, and your property will be protected is the fact that you're in this room. But it won't necessarily, you won't necessarily get the agencies to respond the first, second, or third time you ask. You have to be prepared, in many cases, for a drawn out fight. The difficulty here, and I think many of you know this, is that they have not been treating this as a contamination site. They've been treating it as a development site. They've carved out a portion of the landfill, told the company that they don't need to worry about anything outside of their site. <coughs> and they're saying, at some point, we'll get to the rest of the problem. This is a general problem with New York's Brownfield Cleanup Program. The Brownfield Cleanup Program has some, some strengths. If you have property that's not being cleaned up, no one's doing anything about it, and somebody comes in to develop it, and they, and they clean up the property, <coughs> reduce the contamination, then everybody benefits. They make money, and the community is protected. But when you carve out a portion of the property, and you don't take a public health perspective, then it, you're selling the community short. And you're actually selling short the people who are going to be working in that building. If it's a hotel, maybe the, the periods of exposure will be so short that guests are not at risk, but the employees 
assuredly will be at risk with their high levels of contamination. Now, I want to go back to one thing that I, that, you know, that I should have mentioned before. So we're talking mostly about exposures at the landfill, whether it be the hotel site or the larger landfill. And we're talking about exposures in the immediate neighborhood. However, the groundwater from the landfill, and particularly it's the shallow groundwater that you're most concerned about for vapor intrusion, is moving off site. I guess that's toward Bronxville, is that the mm -hmm. so so or a mile away. But the hotel developer and the city, uh, the, the village of Tuckahoe are taking no responsibility for looking at that. So if this were a, what I would call a normal hazardous waste investigation, you would start out with what is called a conceptual site model. Conceptual, the simplest level, conceptual site model has a source, which could be contaminated groundwater. You would have receptors. And that's maybe like you and your kids. And then a pathway. So the idea is you collect data to fill in this conceptual site model. How many people live nearby? Where is the contamination coming from? And what are the ways, could it be vapor intrusion? Could it be outdoor air? Could it be going through vegetables? TCE and PCE don't do that, but other chemicals that might be in the landfill do. Um, and you, co you collect data to answer these questions. There is no, to my knowledge, there is no plume map of the volatile organic compounds originating at the site. Correct. Normally what you do is, oh, there's contamination here in the groundwater, and you would do this at multiple levels. You know, the, there's the bedrock aquifer and the, the water table. So you would try to create a map so you sample here and here and here, and you somehow figure out, well, it looks like it's here, but this is this is 100 parts per billion, let's say. We're going to keep testing until we get down below 5, maybe down below 1. So you eventually have a map that tells you which way the contamination is moving and how much there is. And you really haven't addressed a site with contaminated groundwater until you have a map like that. Now, it's more complicated here because you have this, this marble karst that has broken up bedrock, so you might not be able to get perfect lines here. Well, you never have perfect lines anyhow. They always just interpolate and make it look like they know where everything is. Yeah? Well, they, they told us from the beginning that once you put a slab on it and then you put the pipes up over the hotel, things will be better. You so think they will even be better. So that, as I said, because of the the, the difference in pressure, that will protect people in the hotel from vapors coming out from below. However, if the vapors, as Don suggests, are coming from outside, they're going to have to keep all the windows closed all the time and somehow remove the stuff that sneaks in when you open the door. So that won't protect you against outdoor air. So, so until they figure out what the pathways are, they cannot say they're being protected. So, so putting that slab is here in this, you know. It's, it's, it's a good thing to do when you've got contact. Yeah. In my community, we would require that system even before we did the sampling. Okay, you want to build in the area we've got, where we've got contamination, you're going to put in a sub-slab depressurization system. It might not have a fan if it's a really low, if we aren't sure there's contamination there. But you would do that because it's a lot easier to install a system like that before you build the building than after. They're trying to do that. They do that. Yeah, and that, that's a good thing. But it doesn't solve the problem that Don identified of outdoor air. And it doesn't solve the problem of people who might live 
down gradient in Bronxville who might be exposed because they haven't done the kind of investigation you do when you identify a hazardous waste site. One other question. Yeah. Should the EPA have been called years ago and would they have done anything about this? I'm just curious because it seems like they just waited for the developer and at that point, you know, the brownfield came in. But could the EPA have been called by the village officials years ago? Prop Based on the data that I've seen, EPA probably did not respond. Um, EPA recently promulgated a rule to you that they could use vapor intrusion as a way of evaluating a site, the air pathway as a way of evaluating a site for inclusion on the Superfund. But in general, DEC has a fairly good vapor intrusion program. What they don't seem to have is an outdoor air intrusion program. We had a hydrogeologist look at through all the water pathways, and I think you saw those maps. But we have multiple maps that show the water is running right through the dump. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing at 9 p.m. Okay, so it's running right through um, into Bronx Hill and Bronx Hill High School and down to Bronx River and under the churches. In addition, it comes up very close to the surface because Bronx Hill actually has a big reputation of flooding. So it's coming right up along the surface when you go about a quarter of a mile from the dump. So, so what you're saying, and this reminds me of sites I've worked on in Maryland, if the contamination, let's, you know, you, you, you basically have contamination when you're the surf, uh, groundwater to the surface, then you have more groundwater down deep in the bedrock. Even if this isn't, contaminated, but this is, as it flows, it may be, come closer to the surface and become a problem elsewhere. So there's a site in North Carolina. And it is yeah. dramatically yeah. contaminated in the bedrock. Yeah. So, so you know, so I think that you have, high, you have higher levels in the bedrock than inside uh, in, the, in the shallow aquifer. That doesn't solve the problem because when it flows down gradient, it gets closer to the surface, so it may threaten people elsewhere. So again, they have not treated this like a hazardous waste site. And it's, it's just a development site where they're, you know, they're doing the right thing. They're building uh, you know, vapor mitigation into the structure. But that's not enough. But the vapor mitigation is only a ventilation system. They keep on talking about some sort of filtration, but we don't believe any of it because the developer is supposed to be in charge of it. So, so it's a, <laughs> it, it works because it's a depressurization system. That is. Building suck up contamination below from from below because they have a lower pressure inside than in the subsurface. When, when you depressurize the subsurface, you may be ventilating the contamination, but the main thing is you're causing the airflow to go downward. They were describing that they were going to force the air out and then up into other areas into vents. So, 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 so what, what they do what they do is they you know they, they put in a for a new building, they would put in a pipe here with holes in it along the way and run it up the side of the building or maybe hide it inside the building, above, supposedly it's supposed to be above the surface with a fan here. And so that pulls air vapors from beneath the building and releases them outside. Okay. Now, if there are high levels, they should be, they should be treating it before they release it into the atmosphere. Often there are not high enough levels to, to treat this is one of the things you should be asking about because you already seem to have high levels in the outdoor air. And, and adding to it well, that's what will adding not to solve it. the problem. They just said they're going to use some sort of carbon filtration. They're not very clear. So, what they're using. so carbon filtration can work. Um, then they send the carbon to a, an Indian reservation to burn it and it causes contamination. Well, the they also say that the developer is going to be in charge of changing the carbon filters. So that would be what we're doing. Once, and that would be the last time we're doing that. So, so they're. On, on my website, by the way, my, my website is cpeo.org. I have a, a recent report called the Stakeholder's Guide to New Construction of Vapor Intrusion Sites. And I highlight a few locations in the country where this is done right. One of those sites is the IBM site in Endicott where 500 homes have vapor mitigation systems. 
And what they're doing right is they have a long-term management plan, or site management plan, which, in which IBM promises to go out to every home every year and check their system. They, I think they're paying for the electricity to run the fans. They are give, pre preparing an annual report. If somebody new moves into a building that should have gotten mitigation but the owner didn't want it, IBM will offer it. So DEC knows how to set up a, a site management plan that will provide for the long-term management of any system that is used to protect people. If there is a, if somebody is saying we're going to use the parking lot to keep vapors from coming up, then they have to check periodically to make sure that that parking lot isn't falling apart, that no one has dug a hole to plant a tree. Actually, that's in their whole thing. They're going to have multiple trees all in the parking lot that's well, supposed to be the cap. So, but they make, you know, they can create a, a bowl under the tree to prevent vapors from coming up, if indeed that is that is the concern. Mm -hmm. Now, New York State have, calls these long-term plan site management plans. They are supposed to prepare them while they are de developing the remedial action work plan. I was worked with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest on a site in the Bronx, the Mount Haven School Campus, where we actually they actually went to court to get the School Construction Authority and DEC to prepare a site management plan earlier rather than after the project was done. They won the case, but it was too late. But in subsequent cases, we pushed them to develop site management plans. You, you never get the full plan until you're all done. We should work on it all along the way. So even though there's a remedial action plan for this, the site management plan provides opportunities. They should be communicating with the community, you folks, about how they should be making sure that whatever they do to, uh, to protect people maintains on, you know, in operation, on site, for the life of the contamination. Who is they? The DEC or the developers? The DEC doesn't communicate with us. And we try, and they just say everything's fine. So, it's simply a political issue? Okay. You know, what do you, what do you do when the government doesn't <coughs> respond? So you, you, you go to your elected state officials, you go to your newspapers, um, you find somebody at DEC who might be sympathetic, um, the fact that they haven't responded thus far doesn't mean that you won't be successful in the long run. And lots of communities have been successful, but it, it is often hard work. Yeah. Did IBM and Endicott pay for the installation yes. of the fans and the yes. mitigation systems in each additional home? Yes. That's, that's a bargaining chip right now, people. I can't do it. I can't do it, but that's a bargain. We said to worry about this outdoor air situation, too. I mean, I'm just talking, you, you got to start somewhere. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. But I have a question. Right now, they're opening this dump up. You know that there's tons of POCs inside the dump, and they're opening us. What sort of protective measures would the DC normally do that we should start demanding? I mean, we have been demanding tenting and vapor extraction and filtration right now, and they're not. I mean, they have a meaningless camp system that is, is equal to being put in my hand up in the air and telling me how much TC is so in the air. So, a, a soil vapor extraction system is it, similar to a subside depressurization system, basically vacuums the subsurface. Uh, typically, it pulls out greater concentrations of contamination, so typically it will have a carbon filter on it. So, the, I believe they're doing soil vapor extraction here. That can be done in a way that doesn't release contamination into the air. Well, they're doing that at the end of the project. Right now, they're not doing construction. They're not doing anything to yeah. protect us from the toxic release during their hole drilling and, and digging yeah. into it and rapid compaction. And, and the, the hole drilling or, or the pile driving, are, this is like a, this is an issue even if you don't have vapor intrusion. When you drive piles into a landfill, you're, you, you're just mix, you're, you're mixing up the devil's bird. You don't know what's down there and you're creating pathways for liquids and gases and uh, it's, a, it's a rather risky business. You know, what they're actually doing, they're drilling micro pile holes yeah. down into the landfill yeah. 80 or more feet. Okay, they're actually yeah. drilling the hole and then they're placing the rebar in the pile, in the, drilling the pile in the hole. 
to the bedrock. Yeah. 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 Essentially, a sealed pipe. Because, well, when I first got involved in this in my community, one of the first things that the, the polluters, the electronics companies in the Navy were required to do is find old agricultural wells that could act as a conduit between the deep, between the shallow contamination, which we knew about, and the deep aquifer, which serves as a water supply. And so, anytime you create a pathway between various levels of the subsurface, you're making it possible for contamination in both the, the liquid and vapor phase to move up or down. And doesn't sound like they're doing that properly. They did say they were going to do a, a cement sheet before they, uh, in those spaces, let's just put it that way. Yeah, they're going to drill them, measure, measure whatever's coming out. If it's valid, they're going to then seal them. Doesn't that sound right? No, they're not sealing. First of all, they're pumping the water down and they're pumping it back all over the site. We have video of uh, whatever they're using. They're pushing water down into these holes and it's coming back up and it's spreading all over, you know, coming through the site. Plus the vapors, we have no, there's no recording of what vapors are coming out of these holes. But they so, are sealing the holes. They do seal them. They so say at the last development meeting that they uh, do seal the holes okay. every night. And then do, they, do they seal them as they go? Every night, he said that they're capped. That's different. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vertical sheet that you need to prevent contamination from moving from 100 feet down to 50 feet down. And once the hole is finished, it gets capped. Yeah, but the capping it at the surface doesn't, that it doesn't prevent the movement of contamination underneath. within the landfill. Okay. Mm -hmm. But as far as it coming out, yeah. 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 But if water is coming to the surface, that is one of the potential causes of the outdoor air contamination. Bring it up. So you're, using, oh, you're pumping water in to cool the drill, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it's, and it's spewing up like uh, like, a, like an oil like an oil well gushing. 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 That's what we saw today at the site. And yeah. it's spilling all over the site. Mm -hmm. And when we saw it early on, uh, there's there's uh, there's gray ash all over the place from from the obviously the ash, and they're just leaving it on the surface mm -hmm. and letting it dry, and then you have a breezy day. And it blows around, yeah. and that's that's the process. So that that is one potential. Actually, there could be many mechanisms for releases into the outdoor air. You know, it doesn't have to just be one. But this is why they need to do an investigation and not simply, you know, put in a mitigation system for new construction. And as they're drilling, isn't that fracturing all the different parts of like this in the subsurface? You could create other pathways for vapors to kind of go horizontally it could it through. Could, it could puncture a barrel of contamination. So, so, so then it's a little cap and pump is consolidating what's going on all the way down, and all the mess they're making as they're going yeah. down through it. Yeah. It might, it might, it might not. <laughs> no, I, I can't guarantee that there's a problem. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you, you started out with a conceptual site model, and my, my partner Bob and I, we come from the Superfund yeah. super program, we understand you're correct in the way things should be done. Now, this, of course, is a ground field site, and that's the designation that the state of New York DEC made. Mm -hmm. The question to you is, have you ever seen any other site less appropriate to be a brownfield site in the first place, and if you have, or whether you have or not, have you ever seen any of these mitigated measures then incorporated into a brownfield site? Because once it becomes a brownfield site, it's game over as far as the regulars, because they can't go back. That's what we find, right? So uh, it, at the Mont Haven, the yeah. Mont Haven site, um, they started with, you know, it's... Where was this, Mont Haven? Mont in the Bronx. Oh. So, old Metro North Rail Yard. So, some of you folks may go through all there all the time. And they put four school campuses in. So here, this is the, this is the property. So, this is the property. There's another school here. So this is the, this is the Brownfield site. This is the entire school campus. This is the track. And what I did working with people in the, the neighborhood, the Bronxboro President's Office, New York lawyers for, the, for public interest, we insisted 
that they address the entire property. And it was a struggle. But the site management plan, plan covers the entire property. They did some cleanup elsewhere in the property. This was the most contaminated area. And we didn't get everything we wanted. We got a lot of what we wanted. Um, so, um, what were the contaminants? So, there were a lot of contaminants, but the ones we were, I was most concerned was, were, were, were TCE and PCE. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, for vapor intrusion, we don't usually focus on petroleum hydrocarbons. Uh, May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in 15 minutes. Did they tent that site when they were working on the most, on the most contaminated areas? Thank you. Yeah. Right. So, petroleum hydrocarbons, like, like benzene. Benzene is very toxic, but it tends to break down when it comes to the surface and contacts oxygen. So you really have to like, have an oil refinery rather than a gas station for petroleum hydrocarbons to be a vapor intrusion issue. There's a large amount of benzene in the air and marble the road. That was one of your maps. But, um, yeah, but yeah. there's, a, there's a, you know, a lot of um, benzene in the air on the Taconic Parkway. I mean, if cars... But I think the numbers that he was showing yeah. were just like the graph you did, where he took the two Well, there's, there's more benzene. It's, yeah. it's, not as, it's not as dramatic as a TCE. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, John asked, did they tent that site when they were working on it? The, I remember. They, they, they might have. But they didn't actually very, have very high levels of those contaminants. So it's more in the, it's, in the upper area? Yeah, in the sub I guess they didn't have much in the upper area at all. So, that's my question is, and any of these sites, including the, the one in Vestal, um, was there significant air monitoring of the, of the outdoor air? And, and was they, it were, they, they did some samples, they didn't find much. Okay. But this is unusual. The uh -huh. site that I've worked on that had significant levels in the outdoor air is in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they actually evacuated a group of residents who lived near a spring that was off gas and TCE into the environment. Were the numbers like this, or were they like this? They were higher. Yeah. Um, they were. Yeah. 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 This is my favorite site, right? Yeah. Um, and and there's an arc, there are a series of, of reports on that on my website. About the modern? Yeah. About that one. But this mod is like where, they, where you put the schools, right? That was the brownfield site that they carved out of the overall they, site. They, they said this is the brownfield site, right? This is a subject right? we said, but it's, 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 it's the same school, same kids, right? You got to do the whole property, and that's the same situation we have here, right? We have a site, right? Yeah. Divided into three parts, and they carved out the middle part yeah. with no rational basis, right? Because from what we understand that. There's a very rational basis. Right, they don't want to deal so with the rest of the park. There. Somebody wants to make money off of it. Right, but they're contiguous. <laughs> they're contiguous, right? Correct. So if, if, if two of the portions of it were so, so, or are so the this, this, needs, this landfill needs to become a, a state in Africa hazardous waste site or state superfund site. Right. How would you mm -hmm. suggest doing that? Because we keep writing to the EPA, we keep on trying to what? So you work, you work with your legislators. So, um, you know, the deaf ear. Federal government. Deaf federal ear all the way up to the county. The deaf so, ear all the way up to the county. So federal mm -hmm. government is part of challenge these days. So, um, <laughs> the, I mentioned the site at Hopewell Junction. Um, that was actually put on the superfund list during the Bush administration. It was done largely because a lot of Republican Congresswoman Sue Kelly championed it. Championed it. I mean, it was contaminated. It deserved to be it. But this, the Bush administration wasn't putting anything on Superfund. And, she, and her constituents contacted her and she fought for it. So all of these things, you know, I work on, on these kinds of sites all over the country. They are half technical and half political. And so I don't know what the exact political leverage you have to pull here to get a response. Mm -hmm. But you do, there's a good chance if, that you can figure that out. And, but yet, again, be, you know, having the data, being right, isn't enough. Writing a letter isn't enough. There is inertia in the system, whether, whether it's corruption or incompetence, I don't know. But there are competent people at DEC that have done good work elsewhere. 
And to the degree that you can elevate this in the public consciousness, whether it be large numbers of people showing up, um, a lot of these sites, the, you know, the, the Endicott site, the Hopewell Junction site, won awards for reporters for the for the Binghamton Press and Sun, Sun Bulletin and the, the Poughkeepsie Journal. So they had reporters who became experts on this site and they won awards for it. And they would just kept reporting about it until something was done. So that worked some places. Um, so uh, the, the thing is, yeah, first you have to figure out what you want. So, you know, I know that, that, that many of you folks work to get the city to try to try to get the city to do an environmental impact statement. Um, that's probably would have been a good idea. But for me, the key thing is to do the actual physical investigation of the site. Delineate the plume. How far does the gra contaminated groundwater move? What are the sources of the contamination that they're finding in, they are finding in the air, not just you? What are the sources of it? And fill, fill in the conceptual site model. And if you find a lot of receptors, and at first I can't give you a number, maybe hundreds, maybe you know, hundreds of people, a lot of receptors who might be affected by the contamination, then you might go to EPA and ask to put them on the Superfund list. That was already tried, and EPA responded to his uh, John Rabius' request to do a preliminary assessment because we've scored the site because yeah. we used to do that. It scores, it's already should be on the Superfund site for air pathway exposure, a direct hit for air. But these numbers, you said 20, 14, 12. These should put a number in a Superfund list by itself. It so, the only so, pathway. so, but one of, one of the factors, again, one the of the factors, responsible. So, so there are two things. One is, <laughs> They're unlikely to, to list a site if they feel that the state is adequately addressing it. And secondly, there's the quantity of people who might be impacted. So if there are a small number of people who are going to be poisoned, that's not enough to put something on the super fence. But the other thing is, this year, oh, that's warm and fuzzy. Or, or next year, we don't know if there'll be an EPA. So. So it is right now. It's probably not a good strategy. No, this is what I normally do. I did in North Carolina. Oh, you've got a bad site. Get the EPA in here. The state's really screwed it up. We'll close it right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so normal. Normally, that is something I advocate. Uh, we need to do some work nationally on, on our uh, <laughs> political leadership uh, before we do that. Uh, so good luck. That's so a good button. Impeach now, replace later. Yeah. <laughs> Lenny, yeah. The, the Endicott site, that was not a brownfield development program, correct? No. That was just a super fun cleanup? State super fun. State oh, super fun cleanup. That's the difference. The brownfield yeah. development program, yeah. they are completely, I, I don't know, they're not incompetent. They know what they're doing. They, they lie. They lie constantly. The so, the so you have you have the rest of the landfill, which they acknowledge has contamination. They aren't addressing it. No. So so you have a, a clear path ahead to get them to treat that as an inactive hazardous waste site. And you've got some some, some data that they well. I mean, they're starting to say, well, look, we should put in some more groundwater monitoring wells to find out where it's going. The, the, the so-called volunteer who's doing a hotel, it's not their job, but we may have to look at these things. These outdoor air numbers, to me, are you know, the, particularly the ones that they generated, are 12 and 14 micrograms per cubic meter. You know, I don't know, how, how, how far is that from the, from the, from the site? Two hundred feet. Uh, yeah, two hundred. Maybe. Yeah, maybe two hundred feet. Yeah. Um, you know, unless somebody can show that that one of the homeowners is, uh, you know, cleaning guns on the front lawn, this, as if it were Texas, you know. <laughs> you know, then then that's the most logical explanation for that contamination is that it's coming from the landfill. 
Well, that was the th that was the thing that the, the developer's attorney said that, it's, that there was an alternative source. So I told the I told the, the village board it might be coming from my house. They, yeah. Come test my house. Yeah, and for, and go. for the pathways and source identification for a long time, and they refused to do any of it. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't even do. Don had asked almost a year and a half ago for them to use was it a magnetometer just to figure out where the tanks and drums are buried, and they refused to do any of that. Right. They won't identify yeah, physical, I mean, as yeah. simple as a geophysical survey. They won't do. They, Even if they did this much testing, it's amazing. The, the last tactic, well, as, as Will said, I am an elected official in my community. We recently approved three hotels. And as a member of the council, I proposed, and my colleagues deferred to my expertise and voted unanimously, that before these hotels are occupied, they need to be sampled. And all the people who work for permanent employees have to be notified of this contamination site. Uh -huh. so, they, won't even tell, uh, they won't even tell the people so, working on the site that it's a contamination site. So what? So what tactic do you think I'm going to suggest that you notify potential employees that it's a contamination site? Well, we've been we've been trying, but we've been. Have they have a very strong PR on the other side that says that they're just spaghetti in there. You know, they keep telling us that it's not it's not dangerous, the DC's got that under control. Is it going to be a union hotel? We don't think so. It's not it's a non union, it's also a non union work site. And also they brought in people to work that came from like Buffalo. They didn't that none of the local contractors would touch it because they know it's hot. So one one point of leverage is you know, well I, I stayed in the Hampton Inn near JFK Airport and there are people picketing there. Yeah. But, that's after it's done. Work, but, yeah, but that's after it's done. Right now, we are being exposed right now. They've opened it up now. They're drilling into it. We were being exposed before they opened it up, and now it's horrific uh, what's so, going on. So you let it be known that, that you've got a group of people that will make sure that people who come to stay at the hotel know it's a contamination site. Okay. Yeah. That's just one tactic. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there, there are lots of things that people have done all over the country to address situations like this. I don't know what's going to work best for you, but the fact that they haven't listened to you thus far doesn't mean that you won't be successful. You've got a lot of expertise, you've got a, a core of people who care, and it's something you have to fight for. That's what people have do, been doing all over the country. These things don't get cleaned up, because usually because there's somebody really smart and good working for the government. Occasionally, but that's not usually what happens. And those communities that, that, that are empowered and exercise that power not only get that cleanup done, but next time something comes up, the agencies are quick to do the right thing because they know they're going to get beat up by the people if they don't. Well, thank you very much.